as the developer of the Ripple concept, the intent was to put together an enabling capability for not only our workforce, but also to try to help in developing products faster and trying to get things to the fleet. So the Ripple concept and the way it's set up has four main areas. There's a think space area which allows people to be able to work on new ideas, to come up with initial concepts, to put subject matter experts together along with warfighters. The second stage is an IT area which has 3D printing capability, plotters, things of that nature that takes those initial concepts and puts together initial uh, prototypes. The third area is a workshop space where you can actually take uh, initial concepts and put together hardware. And then the fourth space is an open area of which it allows people to then take those concepts and put them together and integrate on various platforms. So some of our initial uh, internal research and development funding allows us to develop things such as a silent ATV which is filling a warfighter gap and allows our warfighters to utilize the latest technology when it comes to power and provide them a capability that they have not seen. The Silent ATV is a program that uh, we started here about a year ago at Crane uh, that involved a COTS, uh, basically a commercial M-Razor 2, uh, gas driven. And the goal was to create a silent version of that. Um, there was a science and technology gap in the SOCOM community for a silent ATV. And the approach we chose to take was to remove the internal combustion in engine and replace it with an electrical powertrain. Uh, the electrical powertrain basically consists of two monolith batteries, um, a custom in-house designed gearbox, uh, two air-cooled motors, and a custom controller uh, developed at Crane uh, that uh, has open architecture, which allows us to put multiple payloads into the bed of the vehicle that can utilize the, the huge energy reserve that the vehicle will now have for uh, tasks such as silent watch, um, high energy payloads, um, communications, anything like that. So uh, here at Crane, uh, uh, all the architecture developed in-house, we're developing a tech data package that could be uh, possibly put out for an RFQ or RFI uh, to develop a commercial version of what we're developing here at Crane. Um, the key component of that is the custom gearbox uh, that Lucas Allison will talk about here in a little bit. When we started off on this, you know, this is our actual first prototype of the gearbox for the vehicle. It is a gearbox that is fully replaced, can directly replace the uh, current transmission in the uh, Polaris Razor. Um, this one accommodates two electric motors and it independently drives each tire. So just one gearbox has, it's two-sided. Uh, one side drives the left side tire, uh, the other side drives the right side tire. This will be in the rear of the vehicle initially. Um, we have plans to also put another version of it in the front so we can fully uh, drive each tire independently in four-wheel drive. Uh, some of the when we started looking at this, you know, some of the requirements were we didn't exactly know the full weight ranges that we were going to be dealing with, the speeds that were desired. Uh, so we wanted to leave a gearbox that was uh, universal, but yet accommodating to every type of uh, vehicle that might come into play. So what we looked at, we, needed a, we knew we needed a reduction from the electric motor because they tend to be more uh, perform better at higher RPMs and we needed to gear that down so that we uh, meet the speeds of uh, the vehicle that's required. So when we did this, we have an input shaft in which the electric motor drives and the output shaft which uh, interfaces with the uh, Polaris Razor half shafts. Um, in this drivetrain, we're able to um, utilize the uh, quick change gears that are very common on a uh, uh, sprint car. Um, these come in pairs, so these have uh, different uh, reductions, uh, some anywhere between one to one reductions all the way up to two to one reductions. So if we needed uh, a gearbox to carry more weight and have more, put out more torque and less high speed, we can gear it down lower. If we're looking at some, a lighter weight vehicle in the future, 
uh, we want more top end speed, we can change the gears around and, and adjust that ratio at any time and still utilize the same gearbox. So as you see, these gears just slide in and out. We can put the cover on it and you can tell that uh, this is how it drives. So again, the input, output, and we have a full range of future ratios that we can do to accommodate whatever we need. So this is a uh, software system that we're doing here on base that's doing uh, payload integration in targeting. So what we're trying to do is, is trying to get the guys in the field uh, an easier solution for getting their weapons on target. So where we come in, we have a government owned control system that we write all the software for on base where we will take sensors like ele electro-optic cameras and remote control gun mounts and tie them together when they don't natively do that. So the idea is if they can find something farther out with a camera, identify it as a threat, have a gun automatically slew over to where the camera is looking quickly, and then if it saves them time from detect to engage is what they call it, to try to respond to that threat and take it out before it gets closer to their vessel. One of the coolest things is like whenever we look at the Rosam remotely operated small arms mount, um, it doesn't know anything about the world. So if the operator of that gun mount wants to shoot at something, he has to find it in his sights and then pull the trigger. What we do is, is we'll give him the ability to click on a map and have the gun point to where he just clicked on the map. So if he wants to shoot at that guy that's on the map there, he didn't have to think about it. All he had to do is hit one button and boom, the gun's on the target. That's, that's what's cool to me. So. Some of the things that we're seeing as we start hiring the workforce for tomorrow is the fact that there's very little hands-on capability as, as people we are hiring, the younger folks that are taking over for us older folks. And so what this allows us to do then to be able to uh, build some of those skill sets uh, when it comes to hands-on, making prototypes and things of that nature. So that when you couple the IT savviness of the younger folks with the hands-on skill sets, uh, that enables them to become that much better in supporting warfire requirements.